If you've come to this YouTube channel, you've probably heard me use the term folk filmmakers. It's a term I use a lot in a lot of my videos, but I've never really described it, and I really want to talk about this because I think it is a really, really interesting discussion. Folk filmmakers is a term that one of my friends coined. He's a guy that's not really in the industry, but he is a filmmaker and someone that I really, really respect. He told me this when he watched the film Chlorine. He said, you are a folk filmmaker, and I, I love the term so much that I took it and I coined it as the start of this filmmaking movement. And before I go any further, I think we really need to look at where we are as an indie film community. I think we have a couple different eras for indie filmmaking and filmmakers in general. I think you have that kind of 70s rebellion movement where you have people like George Lucas, Spielberg, Coppola, and they all kind of started their own filmmaking communities and built them into what is Hollywood today. To me, editing is what filmmaking is really all about. Because it's a, the one time you get a chance to create something out of material and actually deal directly with an audience. All the other times you're, you're sort of generating material or supplies. It's like uh, making a film is like buying lumber. They created the blockbuster and they basically destroyed the old Hollywood system of past and replaced it with the new Hollywood movement, the movement we see today. Then we had a sort of mini sort of indie filmmaking rebellion in the 90s. This is the Robert Rodriguez's, the Kevin Smith's, any of those guys that kind of came up in that 90s last kind of films made on actual film. This is right when DIY and digital was coming into the mainstream. If Clerks hadn't have had the Sundance success, if it hadn't have had the wine scenes behind it from day one. Yes, nothing would ever, go ahead, finish the question. Yeah, what what was your plan as an independent filmmaker? Like what, what was step two if Sundance didn't happen? Step two I never really had. And then finally we had that kind of 2000s movement, the Mumblecore, and Mumblecore was a really, really weird movement because it was kind of so specific. It was very much dialogue-based, very low on production value, very low on production design, and, and anything that would really require too much. It was just purely dialogue and drama-driven. It feels really nice to be um, in this community, and I think mm -hmm. one of the cool things about it is everybody's mm -hmm. uh, being so productive, and, and mm -hmm. it's 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 not a situation where somebody completes a film and then uh, spends a lot of time uh, on the road promoting it. It's more like a, somebody completes a film and then mm -hmm. uh, you know we're all working on things at the same time. And, and I think this left a really weird niche for where we are today, because I think there's a ton of filmmakers from the 2000s to 2020 that really didn't belong anywhere. They never got their chance with the mumblecore movement because they didn't want to make movies that are mumblecore. They wanted to make something that was different. And I wanted to create a movement, an idea for those people because where did those people go? And so I decided that folk filmmaking would be its own sort of specific set of rules that would contain a whole new generation of filmmakers. And I think this is the next big wave of indie filmmaking. So when you look at this uh, new movement, there's a lot of names that kind of come in and out and who could be really the first one. The one that I've noticed is Knives Monroe. He made a film called Her Doppelganger, which was I think in like 2011 or 2012. And it was kind of one of the very first movies that I would say in this movement that specifically was independently made and independently released onto YouTube. I think these are two core philosophies that have to be achieved with the indie movement of folk filmmaking. Is first, it has to be independently made, and second of all, it has to be released independently in a free way. I think there's a lot of filmmakers that like to put their stuff on Amazon, and that's awesome, but I don't really think that it actually ref reflects this new idea because I think that still works with the old mindset of how old Hollywood would sell their films. I think this mindset is trying to make our films as open source and as accessible as possible to other 
filmmakers and other watchers. I think there's a lot of relevant filmmakers that kind of are in the movement or around the movement. Some people like Cody Clark, Joel Haver, Josh Stifter, uh, yours truly in some ways. Uh, I'm, I don't want to toot my own horn, but I feel like I have kind of a lot of the makings of a folk filmmaker. I released my film for free. I made it very accessible. And I think another way uh, people are part of this movement is if they're really trying to teach or inspire other people as well. I think the transfer of knowledge, making filmmaking no longer a magician's act, making it something that anyone can do, I think is a very big part of being the folk filmmaker movement. So I'm going to show you a couple clips from movies that I think kind of fit the aesthetic of it, and I'll link to any of them in the description below in this little montage, and check them out. I think these are all great films that all kind of reflect this ethos. Sex is comparable to murder. Rough sex. The kind you gave to me. Murder's quite like it. You know how to do it? You just press the button and inhale? Yep. <coughs> Sometimes people overthink it. When it gets too hard, we make dragons out of geckos. So why don't you come hang out with my friends Anything and me? I will hear you say I'm Carl, by the way. Do you remember when you said I couldn't hang out with Susan anymore? You mean when she broke into our apartment, trunk, and lit our carpet on fire? I realized that my friendship was toxic to our relationship and the life that we were that we are making for ourselves i didn't hesitate i just said yes honey you're absolutely right well if chris something you can do mark who the hell knows right please don't Mm -hmm. Yeah. What? Why are you making that face? I forgot. Breakfast isn't happy food. Breakfast is sad food. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What are you talking about? Because it means you're leaving. They nicknamed anything more badass. It had to be Worm. It had to be Worm.
Now that you've seen a couple of these films, I think there is a lot for this movement to grow. Right now, it's at the infancy. It's at just the start. We're not even popular. We're not getting reviews from big reviewers. We're not being talked about in mainstream media yet. And it might not be five or ten years before that ever happens. Maybe it never happens. But I think that having a movement, something that coalesces around, having one idea, just like the Dogma 95 movement, or just like the 90s movement, or the Mumblecore movement, if we all coalesce under a single vision, a single idea to create and make films, to spread knowledge to other filmmakers, to the audience, I think that is a powerful idea. And for me, the folk filmmaker movement is something that inspires me every day to get out and make films. And I think you, if you were trying to make a feature film, maybe even a short film, I think that this is the type of movement that can inspire you to change your life, to make a film that is for, for people to just watch. Just letting people see the film, I think, is such a powerful way in order to get people to be a part of your journey as a filmmaker. People want to be your friend. They want to want to like your films. But if they're hidden behind a paywall and they're very hard to find, it's very hard to take a risk on someone who they've never heard of, they've never seen before, and they don't know if their film is good, and then they have to spend $5 or they have to get on their Amazon account. But if you release a film on YouTube, like most folk filmmakers do, it really, really adds to the credibility, I think, of your work. Someone recently told me that they were very concerned before they had heard my ethos on folk filmmaking. They were concerned that it would sort of lessen the work if it was on YouTube. And I kind of explained it as the opposite. I said it would actually, I think, make our work more valid because we're not afraid to hide it. We're not putting it behind some streaming service that no one can watch. It's something they can watch right now and they can give me a full critique right away. I don't have to hide my film. Everyone can see it. And if they like it, great. And if they hate it, they're on a comment board on YouTube that everyone can read. What is more transparent than that? And I think that's the number one main thing about folk filmmaking. Transparency. Transparency is the most important thing. We are showing you the films, we're letting you comment on them, we're letting you have a discussion on them, and we're building a community around this, and that's so powerful. So if you have never made a feature film and you don't really fit in with this Hollywood movement or trying to make it in big Hollywood, I think it's time for you to join the folk filmmaking movement Make a film, release it for free, and see what happens. I think it would change your life. Have a great day.